This morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. You might recognize it as the text from the day of Pentecost, which is three weeks ago. (laughs) But since we are still in the season of Pentecost, I thought that I would read it and talk about the significance of this story in reference to what we've been describing as who are we? What does this mean for us to be University Presbyterian Church? So here's the story from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound of a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel in the last days. It will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now everything that follows is not the word of the Lord. In a series on the distinctives between the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and the PCUSA, we are continuing to have these conversations And as a reminder, and I'll probably say this a number of times, this is not a conversation against anyone else. Anybody is free to believe strongly in whatever they feel is true to them. And And we encourage that. And I hope we will all have that sort of spirit about us. These are conversations that are designed to figure out who we are. What do we think together? And it won't be just one thing, but generally speaking, what brings us together as a church? Because until we understand that identity, it's hard to figure out what we're going to do. So let's understand a little bit about who we are. And this is our third uh, session of these conversations. Third of, I don't know how many it's to come. Pentecost is the old Greek and Latin name for the Jewish harvest festival known as uh, Shavuot, or Festival of Weeks, which can be found in the Old Testament in Exodus and in Leviticus. And as you know, the beginning of the church was intrinsically connected to, uh, to everything Jewish. 
Uh, this day of Pentecost was a Jewish holiday and still one of the three major Jewish holidays besides Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. Passover remembered uh, the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. Tabernacles uh, or booths remembers the wanderings in the wilderness. And uh, these were all uh, festivals of um, pilgrimages that were made to Jerusalem. Why you have all these people gathered in Jerusalem? Because uh, people came to the temple for these celebrations. Pentecost commemorates the anniversary, anniversary of God's giving of the law at Sinai and their becoming a nation. So they left Egypt, they wandered through the wilderness, and partway through they stop at Sinai and God brings the law, gives them the law, and they become a nation. And this is what Pentecost celebrates. It also celebrates the, um, uh, the bringing the first fruits of the harvest, and it was done 50 days after Passover, thus the, the term Pentecost. Pentecost is the Greek word for, or the Greek name signifying 50. Now, I've given the title of the sermon, if you noticed, from they to we. And I've done that because as we look at the beginning of the church, I believe this is exactly what was happening in this event. Here were all of these people gathered in Jerusalem, and they went, and, and the writer goes on and on, almost like, okay, come on, we get it already. They're from everywhere. All these different people are gathered in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, God speaks to them in their native language. And all of a sudden, these different people from all over the world are taken from a they status to a we status. It's no longer they, but now they heard God speaking to them, and they are all included in the message. Through this event, the church was born. It happened on Pentecost. Maybe it was signifying uh, something new about the nation of Israel. Okay, the nation was born in Sinai. Now, something else is happening. You remember Abraham's covenant, the word to Abraham? He said that, I'm going to call you, but that through you, what? All the families of the earth shall be blessed, right? So in other words, maybe this is the second half of that promise, the second half of of that calling. And later in the book of Acts, who else is going to be included? Besides all the Jews in all the world who are very different from one another, they didn't agree on things, uh, they had various attitudes of superiority. By the way, you, you see here that it says, even Cretans, even the Arabs. Well, that's kind of an insult. Be like saying, all the cities of America are great to live in, even Sacramento. You know, I mean, that's like, what? You know, they're nice people in every state of the union, even California, you know. So they were all hearing about God's wonderful work, even the Cretans and the Arabs. They were all included, even with their differences. What a dramatic moment this must have been. Wind everywhere and fire everywhere and something that looked like a tongue everywhere flying around. I don't know. It's kind of a wild scene, isn't it? All these people come rushing over. What's happening? And all of a sudden, they hear in their own language people talking. They knew they didn't know their language. All of a sudden, they hear these things. I see this as a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel? God divided their language, and scattered them. Now all of a sudden, God uses language to bring them together. They're, they're included. They're now included, not based upon necessarily their agreement, but they're included based upon a decision that is being made by God. God had something else in mind for the, for the church. He uses language to bring people together, to declare them all included. Not based upon them or their great ideas and plans. You know what brought the people of Babel together? Remember? Their project. We had a great project. 
And let's all get together. Well, what happens when you all come together? Because you all have a great project. All a great project that everybody needs to be a part of. What happens? <laughs> Some get left out, don't they? I mean, what if you don't want to be the, do that project? It's actually unity based around something that we do as humans is always the beginning of oppression, by the way. It's always the seed of oppression because you've always got people who are naysayers or don't get in line. It's always frustrating. But here's a different message. Jesus comes, let's just think about this, to eliminate the they. And we see it on Pentecost, it happens. There are no longer any theys. No longer anybody looking in from the outside. I wonder what's going on over there. All of a sudden, God, with his gift of languages, pulls everybody in. You're all included. You're all in. All of a sudden, he takes people who were, saw themselves as a they, separate from the, these people, separate from those people. All of a sudden, they're brought in and no longer looking from the outside. So here's the distinction for today. And it comes with the heading, The Meaning of the Church. The meaning of the church. What is the church? Evangelical theology describes the church as the company of the true children of God. The true members of God's family. Those who know the truth, as outlined in their statement of faith, they know the truth about Jesus, and have made a commitment to belief in those truths. This message is delivered to those outside the church, to the world, who are not included yet in God's family, inviting them to join them in accepting Jesus, accepting Christ, to receive them as their personal Lord and Savior, and then as a result be accepted by God and other believers and included. That is kind of the evangelical, rough evangelical message. They use the word saved to indicate those who are in, who are now based on their agreement and commitment, the chosen of God, the family of God. And they now try to encourage those outside in the world to make a similar commitment to become one of the in. Okay, is that clear? Can I see that sort of picture? So you get included, you get included by hearing about Jesus and by turning from your sin, receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and now you're in the church. Okay? That's basically evangelical theology of the church. They're unified around a common commitment and agreement to their mission and statement of faith. Okay, those that are in are called the church. Those that are out are called the world. The job of the church becomes to get those in the world into the church. Okay, so that's, everybody's heard that sort of, it's, there's a flavor of it. There's some differences and distinctions, but here's, Here's how the here's another way that you might understand the church. This is a the way the PCUSA might see the church. And it comes from Pentecost. The church, like those gathered in the text of Pentecost, is the represent, representation of the entire world. And it's a very subtle differences, but very important for you to, to grasp. Jesus was God's announcement of welcome and inclusion for all, not just those who agree with it. Okay? Now, hang in there with me. Even the most unlikely, the Cretans, the Californians, (laughs) Sacramentoans, you know, even those guys are included. Even the Gentiles, even the Samaritans, even the lepers, even the tax collectors, even the drunkards, even the prostitutes. Jesus goes out of his way to reach the most marginal people. Why does he do that? 
Why, why does it go out? Why does the Bible really only remember stories of Jesus reaching out to the most unacceptable people in the culture? It's like if they could find somebody more acceptable, Jesus would have reached out to them. Why is that? Because of the message. Go ahead, Nancy, you want to say? Because God loved them. But the message is, how are we going to feel loved if we don't know that no one's outside? Because if love's not for free, we don't get to feel it. All right. I think the Bible makes a very special point that the church is the company of people who believe. Now watch what I'm going to say here in a minute. Who believe. Not just they were included, but that the whole world was included with them in Jesus. It's a very important distinction. The church are not just the people who believe they're included because they believe certain doctrines or teachings, but they're included because they were included by God in Jesus along with everybody in the world. No one has been forgotten or left out. No one's been excluded or dismissed or passed over. All have been remembered, welcomed. And that is a very crucial difference. The message is not, in my opinion, come to the church, come to Jesus, accept him, receive him, commit yourself to him so you can be included in the, in the community of the loved and the accepted like us. I don't believe that's the message of the church. I believe the message of the church is you have been included by the love and power of God's action in Jesus. Welcome to the community. Come join us. Not do this so you will be welcomed. Not do this so you will be included. But you, by God, by his power, by what he's done, has welcomed you in, included you in, put your name wherever he puts your name, and set a place for you at the table. Come eat. That is the message of the church, in my opinion. He's taken away all the reasons to stay away, all the reasons to feel excluded, removed all the roadblocks, whatever they may be, invites us to believe it, or at least consider it, or at least begin to hear it. And if I can begin to trust that this is true, that I've been brought in, that I've been welcomed, that I've been included even before I even heard about it, if I can believe that that's true, I can do what the prodigal son did. I can let the father put a ring on my finger and a robe on my back, and I can find my way into the party. Because now I have no reason to stay out because he brought me in. Because it will dawn on me, just as it did for the prodigal, that I'm not there because I'm good enough or smart enough or right enough or spiritual enough or moral enough. I've been welcomed by a loving God from the first moment of my birth. And that pronouncement cannot or will not ever change. Don't you know how many people feel they don't fit in the church? So many people feel they don't fit in. They're not good enough or they don't believe the right things, or they just don't, they don't see it that way, or whatever. It's the last p- thing people should think about when they think of the church. The last thing they should think about. The action of God prior to my response is what allows me to trust him. You get included by God and Jesus. This is the message and the purpose and the meaning of the church. Let me come to the last line, because this is the last line in our text, is what often gives people a hard time. This is what causes people to have a difficulty. We're so used to hearing something conditional. (laughs) We're ready for it. We're ready for, hey, this is free. Oh, but it'll cost you. You know, we're so... We're so ready for this bait and switch thing. You know, so watch this last line that can happen here. The last line that says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And a condition? 
the, theolog- the, the evangelical theologian usually takes that to mean that if we don't believe or call on the Lord, we won't get in, we won't be included, we won't be a part of the family of God. That's the way evangelical theology interprets that. It's just not the only way to interpret it. It will be heard often as an entrance requirement. And if you hear it as an entrance requirement, then we're ignoring everything we've just said. (laughs) If we remember that we've already been declared in, already been pronounced welcomed, already been included, then we can see this in another way. Because if you're already, if you've already been included, then calling on the Lord or trusting in the Lord is not so I can be included among the acceptable, but that trusting in God and in what God has done has already made me accepted. That trusting that I've already been included in Christ. Do you get the difference? Mm-hmm. Trusting that I've already been included and welcomed. How is this saved? <laughs> well, because it sets me free. Free from a system of performance and good enough beliefs or good enough actions or good enough anything. Free uh, to make decisions and, and free as a result of God's decisions and actions, not mine. Belief sets me free. Belief saves me from shame, from trying to measure up, or by not being good enough or faithful enough, because he accepted me, forgave me, and receives me without strings and without condition. When I believe, when when what I believe is that God already included me in Jesus, when I believe that, I am saved. And I I keep working to believe it, because I don't all believe it all at once. I like through my life I, I try to believe that God loves me and has accepted me as I am. It takes time, over time. Save me from having to fake it or pretend like I believe. Or save me from loneliness that shame produces. Or save me from guilt because I don't feel like I measure up. Free to feel forgiven. Free to feel safe and loved. Free to be honest. Free to have answers. Free to disagree. Free to be puzzled. Free to be confused. Free to be who I am. Because God has already included me in Jesus Christ. I can begin to rest in an identity that's not of my own making. Identity that I receive as a gift for free from God. One that is full and whole. Not dependent on me. Free for me to hear him call my name in my own language. You all have your own language. You know what that means? You you all have your own bents. Your own uniqueness. Your own special thing that makes you you. You get to hear God in your own language, call your name, welcome you in, include you from the foundation of the earth. From the moment of your birth, he has brought you in and welcomed you. And you can believe it. And once you believe it, you stop working for it. You start living in it. You start enjoying it. You start letting go of all those things that we hide ourselves from other people. We stop hiding our vulnerabilities and just just who we are. We have some weaknesses. We've got some positive things. I don't know everything. I'm wrong in some areas. We, 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 We don't have to hide any of that anymore because our identity is not based on us, on what we do and what we believe and what we think. It's not based on that any longer. It's not an entrance. There are no entrance exams. You know that? The teacher just stood up and said, oh, there won't be a final today. What? No final? Yeah, this is fantastic. I love this group that says, um, what does this mean? I love the group that came and said, what does this mean? (laughs) That's great. I put that on the bulletin. What does this mean? Well, you see, that's part of uh, 
That's the beginning of faith. That's the beginning of trust right there. Tell me more about that. What's going on here? The other people said, ah, they're drunk. You know, that's okay. Doesn't mean it's not true for them. They're still included. They still heard the, the, the words in their language. They weren't ready to hear it. It's all right. They're still, they're, still one, they're still caught in performance, as we all are in some respects. We all kind of have both, both responses. Tell me more. You're drunk. You know? We both kind of waffle back and forth between that. But in, over time, we begin to understand, God, God loves me. He loved me before I even knew it, knew him, or knew anything about him. God included me. I'm going to close with this quick story. You've heard that before, right? Quick story. <laughs> Years ago, I read a story about an 11-year-old boy who had been diagnosed with cancer. And he had to leave school for a period of time to undergo chemotherapy treatments. And after several weeks, he was ready to come back to class, but he had lost all of his hair, as often happens. And when he walked back into the classroom, this, I think it was fifth grade classroom, we walked back in the classroom, the kids had made this big sign for him that said, welcome home, welcome back. But then as he looked around the room, he noticed that all the other kids in the class had shaved their heads. So he wouldn't feel alone. So he wouldn't feel embarrassed. So we wouldn't feel on the outside. That's what we're called to do as a church, I think. That's what we're called to be. We don't see ourselves as different or more special than anyone else in the world. We're the same. Our inclusion is not based on something we thought or done or believed. It's what God has done. It's what he has said. It's what he's made happen for us and for everyone else in the world. We shave our heads if necessary so others feel welcome and not alone. We're, the company, we're not the company of the superior or the company of the better informed or the more included over the rest of the world or the company of those who get it right, therefore more special, but carriers of the message that God has included us all in his embrace, none left outside, all brought near. We are proof that God has left no one out. We are just like everyone else, and everyone else who comes into the church should see a sea of shaved heads. That'd be good in here. We see a lot of shaved heads. <laughs> right, Edrin? Shaved heads. A sea of shaved heads. So they would never feel like a they when they walk into this room or when they come in contact with us as a church. Never feel like a, a they. But a we, right from the start, you're, you're a part of us. You're a we. Now, what do you think? How do you, how do you feel about what's going on? You're a we. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.